Hello class, this is Demetrius Wilson and this is Management 2. We're now on Chapter 13, Managing Work Groups and Teams. I look a little different, got my uh, pre-haircut blowout going on. Uh, learning outcomes. Uh, after studying this chapter, you should be able to uh, define and identify types of groups and teams and organizations, discuss reasons people join groups and teams, and list the stages of group and team development, uh, also known as forming, storming, norming, and performing. Identify and discuss four essential characteristics of groups and teams. Discuss interpersonal and intergroup conflict in organizations. Describe how organizations manage conflict and conflict uh, resolution and conflict management is a big thing. If you can do that, you will always have a job. And describe the negotiation process. Uh, management in action. Uh, management by clowning around. It's difficult to be creative in isolation. Uh, and there is an actual thing called uh, management by wandering around. And uh, manager just walks around, interacts with the individuals within a department, and things uh, things do come up, uh, which is which is a good thing. Uh, you know, a lot of companies stress the fact that that managers need to spend more time with their employees and or associates, uh, but it brings on collaboration and great ideas. Uh, like the CEO from uh, Yahoo that told everyone uh, that was uh, home short or uh, telecommuted that they need to come in. Uh, to the office uh, going forward uh, because they're missing that uh, collaboration where I see you in the hallway and we talk about an idea and then we then we collaborate and move forward on it. So, you know, don't want to miss those opportunities. So be sure to read the stories at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, great as always. Uh, you know, they give some great examples. And uh, here we go with uh, chapter 13. Almost there. It's only 15 chapters uh, in this book. Uh, a group is a, it consists of two or more people who interact regularly to accomplish a common purpose or, go or goal, right? So uh, you, you can't, like, you hear the commercial army of one. Uh, you can be army of one, but you can't be a group of one. It has to be uh, two or more people. Uh, you can have a functional group. This is a permanent group uh, created by the organization to accomplish a number of organizational purposes within an unspecified time horizon. So uh, we're in a certain group, and the group has been created by the company. Uh, so that's that's the in the company initiated and, and formed this group as opposed to those individuals forming, like you say, an informal group, uh, like when all the smokers go out to uh, have a smoke break at 945. Uh, informal or interest group uh, created by its members for purposes that may or may not be relative to those of the organization, right? Obviously, smoking is not relative to the uh, needs of the organization, neither is a softball team, uh, but those informal groups can be created. Nice little diagram here uh, shows you about the types of groups and organizations. Uh, every organization has many different types of groups. In this hypothetical organization, a functional group is shown within the purple, er, purple area, um, a cross-functional team within the yellow area, and an informal group within the green area. All right? So let's look at our, our purple area. You see that uh, with the project managers, and then you see uh, green area over here. Uh, for our informal group, uh, could be all of these individuals. Uh, Cross-functional team goes between different departments. All right, so uh, you you, get, you see this if you work at, especially if you work in an office place, you see this all the time. Uh, you see people from different departments that form an informal group. Uh, they're friends, they're buddies, they go on walks together, uh, they go to lunch together. And then you also have people who are formed together as a formal group, the people on your actual work team. A task group is a group created by the organization to accomplish a relatively narrow range of purposes, uh, which in a stated or implied time horizon, right? So you have a stated time. You guys have 30 days to complete this project. I'm picking you from customer service, you from claims, uh, you from uh, the administrative department, putting you guys all together, and this is a goal that you're going to work towards. Uh, at your service, use customer uh, created groups for competitive advantages. Uh, a company I work for, we definitely, uh, you know, utilize that where we can uh, help our customers a little bit better uh, by by getting a number of different departments, putting them together, and, and kind of doing a, a permanent task force that will assist our, our clients that need that type of assistance. Uh, so I want you to definitely read that story. Uh, a lot of companies are, are moving towards that. 
a team, a group of workers that function as a unit. I have a team at work, which is our, our unit, uh, often with little or no supervision to carry out work-related tasks, functions, and activities, right? I, I, I don't, I do have little or no supervision, but not to the state that nobody's watching me, but it's just that the person who I report to has a lot of other responsibilities, uh, so that the individual doesn't have time to just sit there and babysit me in terms of what I'm doing. Yes, we meet, we correspond. Uh, check up, say, hey, this is what I've got going. Uh, where are we at with this? Where are we at with that? But uh, if that individual had the time to sit with me the whole time, then they're paying one of us uh, too much, right? Uh, so, uh, so the directives mostly come from me, but you know, I'm not going to do anything outside of the confines of what my direct manager uh, wants me to do. If I feel like I'm going in a direction that maybe we're not on the same page, then then we'd meet and uh, and we'd go from there. Uh, virtual teams or telecommuting. Uh, <clears throat> teams composed of people with uh, remote work sites who uh, work together online. So uh, more than half of my team uh, works from home, right? So uh, I think I have, I've to told of 14, I have eight that are home short, and then I have six that work in the office with me. So, uh, you know, it's quite interesting when you look at that dynamic. Look at one of the videos, it talks about the fact that people can be close. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're close in proximity, like I can just elbow you but you're just close in terms of maybe we've bonded, have some type of relationship, figured out certain things that we have in common, and uh, you know just like corresponding and talking with each other. So these are the different types of teams. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want you to make sure that you uh, read what type of team they are and then read the definition. So you have problem-solving teams. Uh, they're the most popular type of team. They're asked to, you know, to solve a problem. They have a task at hand. They have a management team, work team, virtual team we just talked about. And a quality circle, this is a declining in popularity, quality circles, compromising uh, workers and supervisors who meet intermittently. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, not compromising, but comprising workers and supervisors who meet intermittently uh, to discuss work pay pro workplace problems. Right. So this could be like a, a group like, uh, for instance, I was on the safety committee and then, uh, you know, we met and we said, OK, people have these secret microwaves and they have these heaters that don't have uh, flip switches and stuff like that. What are we going to do to fix that? <clears throat> right. So they have examples all throughout. Uh, give you some examples there. Uh, this one's interesting. People sometimes uh, join groups in order to engage in certain activities. These young men, for instance, are playing flag football at a city park. Or some guys get, get together, a lot of testosterone, say, hey, you know, we want to, you know, stay, you know, we want to continue to play football and everything like that. Uh, you know, I had a chance to play in a faculty versus students football game on, uh, I was at on, on last Friday. I didn't do it because I was too busy, uh, but I did, I did think about it. So you see, you know, people, especially when they're younger and they have a little bit more time, it's like, hey, let's form a basketball league, let's form this, let's form that. For my alumni, where I went to school, Xavier, there's actually enough people in Los Angeles that they actually have a Xavier softball team. And I just learned that uh, today when I read the Xavier magazine. So that was quite, that was quite funny. <clears throat> and Xavier, when I say Xavier, Xavier, uh, the one in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, not the one in Louisiana. There are, there are two. Whenever I say Xavier, people always mention to me and they say, hey, oh, you went to school in Louisiana? No, not exactly. I went to school in Ohio. Uh, so these are stages of group development. I'm going to scroll back up to the uh, diagram because it's very, it's actually a great one. Uh, but this is what I was talking about at the beginning of the chapter. So as groups mature, they tend to evolve through four distinct stages of development. Managers must understand that group members need time to become acquainted, accept each other, and sometimes that never happens, uh, develop a group structure, and become comfortable with their roles in the group before they can begin to work directly and accomplish goals. So you can't just take people Hodge pops them together and think that they're just going to, you know, sit, hold hands, sing Kumbaya and just love each other and be the best group ever. It just does not work like that. Uh, so first step, forming members get acquainted and test interpersonal behaviors. Slow evolution to the next stage. Storming. And yes, this is necessary. Members develop group structure and patterns of interaction. Uh, burst activity uh, to the next stage. Then they norm. So norming. Uh, members share acceptance of roles and sense of unity, right? Even though we've done some arguing, we still bond and have that sense of unity. And then performing. Uh, slow so evolution uh, to the next stage. Performing uh, members enact roles and direct effort toward goal attainment and performance. So now we're on board. We all know what we need to do. 
We've normed it out, and now we're going to perform to the best of our abilities. And yes, the groups all have to go through those different stages, where it's a group of a, a sports team or whether it's in the office, it's the same thing. The role is the part an individual plays in a group uh, that helps uh, to uh, gr- helps the group to actually reach their, their goals because everybody has a different role, right? Uh, maybe there are three people in the group that have similar roles, but people all have different roles. Then you have your role structure. This is a set of defined roles or in, and interpersonal or interrelationships among those roles uh, that the group members define and accept, right? So what's your role structure? How's it set up? Uh, you know, are two people isolated? Is everybody on the same page? Role ambiguity. Anytime you hear ambiguity, just think of the two shoulders. I got the good side. I got the, the bad side. Which one am I listening to? Or maybe it's just that I have two options. Not that one's not good or bad. Uh, arises when <clears throat> the scent role, right? This is what you're supposed to do, is unclear and the individual does not know what's expected of him or her. So now I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm confused. People, when they get confused, they withdraw. Uh, so the development of a role, which is uh, right here, not a role that you eat. Uh, roles and role structures within a group generally evolve through a series of role episodes. The first two stages of role development are group processes, as the group members let individuals know what is expected of them. I'm, we're going to let you know this is what we need from you. Uh, the other two parts are individual processes, as the new group members perceive and enact their roles, right? So expected role, sent role, perceived role, enacted role, and then it goes uh, continues to go through the through the cycle, right? <clears throat> role conflict, and this goes back to the role ambiguity, occurs when the message and cues comp, uh, composing the sent role are clear but contradictory or mutually exclu- exclusive, right? So I'm telling you, hey, I want you to make more money. And then I'm also telling you, I want you to sell less cars. Now, that's the direct conflict. I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, which which one is it, right? You're confusing people. You give them a role conflict. A role overload occurs when uh, expectation for the role exceed the individual's capabilities to perform. So I was supposed to get this job that takes me from A to M. But in reality, it takes me from A to Z, and A to Z is not within my wheelhouse. It's not within my capabilities of completing or doing. So when that happens... Uh, you know, I get role overload. I'm overloaded with the work. I'm overloaded with the stress. I'm overloaded with, uh, you know, the things that this uh, position uh, requires. Uh, measuring carbon footprints, uh, s- sustainability matters. And yes, it does. We've been talking about that all throughout the book. I want you guys to make sure that you read that story. Uh, do your best, at, uh, and, you know, and things that you can do to, uh, to help our environment. Uh, norms, this is and not the restaurant. This is just a standard of what, you know, what people do. In certain situations, standards of behavior that the group accepts and expects of its members, right? So I accept uh, this is what you're going to be doing, and I expect that you're going to do this, right? Uh, so the, these are the different norms, and, and norms are different in different companies. Uh, you know, like one of the companies I always use an example of Zappos, and you know they talk about them in the book as well, uh, where you look up the norms for Zappos, and it's a little bit different than most companies, but they also have such great customer service and people with such great, great attitudes. At the company, right? I uh, even uh, I was interviewing for this company, and they had uh, they it, like there was a, a thing on their site, and they have spontaneous dance parties, like no jokes. So I'm looking at the video of the company, people just walking around normal, and then like disco lights came on, some music came on, pumping, and they just everybody just start dancing, all right? And uh, you know they were they were doing pretty well. You know you could tell they had a lot of spontaneous dance parties, and this was not some you know small company either. So. Um, it's quite interesting to see certain things like that. Uh, socialization. This is generalized norm conformity that occurs uh, as a person uh, makes a transition from being an outsider to being an insider in the organization. Right now, you've entered the circle of trust, as they would say in, uh, in Meet the Falkers. Uh, cohesiveness, right? You know, togetherness, uh, working together well. Uh, the t- extent to which uh, members are loyal and committed to the group. Uh, the degree of uh, mutual uh, attractiveness within the within the group. So not the that you know I, I, you know attracted to you like I love you, but more attracted to working with that individual, working with that group, and accomplishing the goals that we've been set out to accomplish. Uh, factors that influence group cohesiveness, right? So factors that can increase co- group co- cohesiveness. So these are the good ones, right? So keep these, do these. Uh, intergroup competition, right? Good, healthy competition, personal attraction, uh, favorable ev- evaluation, agreement on goals, and interaction. Now, these are the factors 
that uh, reduce cohesiveness, uh, group size, right? So if it's too too big, too small, uh, disagreement on goals, intergroup competition, domination, and unpleasant experiences, right? Those uh, factors uh, they diminish the possibility of group cohesiveness cohesiveness ever occurring. <clears throat> All right, uh, figure 13.4, I want you to, to check out the diagram on this one. Not going to go all the way through it, but the interaction between cohesiveness and performance norms, uh, I want you to uh, to review that as well. <clears throat> uh, informal leader is somebody who's not who's not bestowed, uh, the power of the company has not been bestowed upon them, but they're that informal leader. They're the one that's going to speak out to, you know, to the company or to the union uh, about things uh, being good and possibly uh, being bad. But they're that that informal leader, not necessarily somebody who has the title. Uh, there's a person who engages in leadership activities, but whose right to do so has not been formally recognized by the organization or group. And that's always interesting because there's typically a reason why they haven't formally uh, you know, introduce that person as as, as a leader. Uh, conflict uh, is a, a disagreement among two or more individuals or groups, right? So if you have, uh, you know, conflict uh, with another individual, not necessarily with yourself, but that would be interpersonal inner conflict within your head. But uh, disagreement among two or more individuals or groups, right? Uh, you have to learn how to, to manage conflict, whether it be with yourself uh, within the workplace or, uh, you know, at home or, or or anywhere else. You have to learn how to uh, to manage conflict because it's, uh, it's going to be there. It's not going anywhere. Conflict will be there for forever, for as long as we, we are here. <clears throat> so the nature of organizational conflict, I want you to, to, to review that as well. And all organizations have conflict. Uh, but, you know, if you look back, we had that forming, norming, storming, uh, forming, storming, norming, and conforming, right, where they stormed, right? And it's normal for the group to get the storm part off. I know companies would like to just take that out, but it's it's a necessary. And if it doesn't go uh, appropriately, uh, then you're not going to get the right results. <clears throat> Uh-oh. A little too fast. So conflicts between organizations and environments. Be sure to read that because that's always interesting. Uh, you know, are you doing things for the corporation? Or are you doing things also for the environment? Uh, so these are message, methods for managing conflict. Uh, so stimulating conflict, increase competition among individuals and teams, hire outsiders to shake things up. I believe I've got my last two jobs because I'm an outsider, didn't know anybody in the company, came in, clean slate and just, you know, and, and was able to work. Uh, change established procedures, uh, controlling conflict, expand resource base, and enhance co uh, coordination of interdependence, uh, set superordinate, uh, subordinate goals, and then uh, match personalities and work habits of employees. Uh, resolving and eliminating conflict. So this is the best part. You want to resolve it. You want to eliminate it. You know, let's shake hands and let's let's move forward. You want to avoid the conflict, uh, but that's not that's not fixing it. Uh, convince conflicting parties to compromise. If you do that, that's great. Uh, and bring conflicting parties together to confront and negotiate uh, conflict. And some people don't want to do so, but uh, but it's good to to negotiate in terms of in terms of conflict. So as you read through, you'll see each one has their own section. So I want you to read each one of those, uh, you know, learn a little bit more about, you know, resolving conflict and things of that nature. Now, now negotiation, as I talked about, that's a way that you can resolve some conflict because you can just sit down with the other individual and negotiate unless you have a union. Uh, the process in which two or more parties, uh, people or groups, reach an agreement on an issue, uh, even though they have a different uh, preferences regarding that issue. Right. So we have different preferences. Uh, <clears throat> I say tomato, you say tomato, right? Then we're going to go ahead and negotiate. Now, if we negotiate with someone who's just there helping us negotiate, then that's it. Whatever that person says is not binding. Even if it's a mediator uh, and they they give their suggestions, that does not mean that their suggestions are binding. Uh, now, if it's an arbitrator, that's a little bit different. Uh, if they say it, then it goes. <clears throat> I thought I saw one there that I want to share with you, but I guess not. And that's the end of uh, chapter 13. So now we're at the summary of learning outcomes and key points. Uh, be sure to read those as always. They're great points. If you if you read through these and start you know, asking yourself the questions uh, and you don't know something, that means you need to refer back to the chapter and read the chapter a little bit more thoroughly. Sometimes you have to read these things over and over again, not over and over again like four or five times, but over and over again like the second time that you read it, you will absolutely get it. Uh, so, uh, so be sure to... Um, 
uh, review chapter 13, take the chapter 13 uh, quiz, and then uh, do your homework. And then also you have your uh, test number three, which will be on chapters uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Right, so first chapter is one. Uh, first test was one, two, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, second test was five, six, seven, eight. Now this uh, third test will be on nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So hopefully uh, you study a lot. Uh, hopefully it's all sinking into your brain, and and you'll get it from there. So as always, I want you all to have a good day and a great week.